Aloha and welcome to A Word with Ward. I'm Representative Gene Ward and today we're going to have a word about science, about evolution, about all you wanted to know about the Hawaiian Island and the hotspots. Not your computer hotspot, but something to have to do with volcanoes. And to speak with us, we have one of the experts from the University of Hawaii, Professor Brian Glazer. Brian, welcome. Nice to meet you. Thank you. This is going to be an exciting thing because this is all about how in the beginning Hawaii was formed as a volcano and then became a basically set of islands. And what I'd like to do is first get us a bit of the background. We usually start out with subjects that are very interesting, but then people say, well, who's really talking behind and, and, and who's the individual doing that? Give us a little bit about who Brian Glazer is, the professor of uh, oceanography. Sure, thanks. I first came to Hawaii long ago, but I first came permanently uh, about 10 years ago as a postdoctoral fellow with the NASA Astrobiology Institute here at UH. I was studying deep sea hydrothermal systems, underwater volcanoes, mm -hmm. and I uh, was funded basically for two years to do some of that work here. That was your dissertation then? Uh, yeah. My dissertation was a variety of different chemistry and biology oh. parts, and some of that w did take place at undersea volcanoes. And so the postdoc was a little bit of an extension of that and thinking about the mm -hmm. deep sea floor. Uh, about two years into that, I uh, became faculty member in the oceanography department and was very happy to be able to stay in Hawaii and continue some of the same lines of research as well as expand them. And now we've got something that uh, you have done that probably nobody heretofore has done, and that is to really get down at the bottom where Hawaii is really recreating another island, just off the big island. And it is. And so just off the big, big island, we're very lucky. We have a, a brand new island rising, and it's a few hundred thousand years old, and in another hundred thousand years or so, it may break the surface and become real estate. So if any viewers are out there wanting to buy a little bit of this, how many years we got to wait for Maybe it? Maybe a hundred thousand or so. <laughs> so it'll be a while. It's you investors, investment. hold on to your money. Right. Um, and the summit of Luihi has been studied for decades. In 96, there was an eruption, and there was a, a fair amount of excitement and research occurring at the summit, a thousand meters below the surface. Uh, it looks very similar to Volcanoes National Park, taking a walk, except it's a thousand meters deep in the cold, dark ocean, and is orange from, instead of smoke that you get from, say, Kilauea at the volcano, you get uh, hydrothermal fluids, warm fluids coming out of vents and cracks and fissures. They're very iron rich, and so all of the volcano takes on this orange rust-like tint. Mm. So we're today studying some, uh, some aspects of what uh, was hypothesized decades ago at the summit, and about six years ago we found a similar site at the very base of the volcano, 5,000 meters deep, that had not been predicted before. And so that was really the um, the topic of interest for this most recent expedition that we led a couple months ago. 5,000 meters deep, that's like three miles down? 15,000 feet or so, yeah. Wow, yeah. That, and that was with uh, the drones or that? Exactly, and so okay. worldwide there are very few vehicles, that tools that are available to us as researchers to reach the bottom of the seafloor. Certainly most Navy submarines don't have a need to go that deep. Work class ROVs that are working in oil industry mm -hmm. don't really have a need to usually work But UH has got one. You guys have got one. Not or exactly. Two. We have or one, a new one, it, and it's getting ready. Uh, the one that we used on this recent expedition comes from the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, and it was an AUV, an autonomous underwater vehicle, a robot like a helicopter mm. almost for underwater. Uh, it uh, doesn't get tired, it doesn't get bored, it goes and maps, and it does a very good job of that. Uh, this is a good, for those of you who are watching uh, my last show with uh, Larry Osborne, we were talking about drones and unmanned uh, aerial vehicles, underwater vehicles, and driverless cars, and you name it as the future of what is going on. But now we've got actually a look underneath what's going on in the Big Island to know what was the past and what may be the future. I understand you've got some good visuals. In fact, you have, I understand you're a YouTube uh, star and you've got a good three minute that we can give everybody a good background look at what we're going to be talking about in more detail. Sure, absolutely. The folks at the uh, University of Hawaii at Manoa Media Center put together a great little three and a half minute clip. The Lo'ihi Seamount is an active underwater volcano just over a half mile below the ocean surface, 21 miles southeast of the island of Hawaii. Now there is a greater understanding of the youngest volcano in the Hawaiian island chain and the role submerged volcanoes play in Earth's history after a scientific expedition in the summer of 2014 led by researchers from the University of Hawaii at Manoa School of Ocean and Earth Science and Technology. 
Luihi is a very wonderful natural laboratory in our backyard for studying earth processes that have happened in, in the past. And so while today Luihi might, might be unique, uh, there are times in earth history when much of the global ocean looks like Luihi does today. The other key collaborators in the groundbreaking expedition were the Schmidt Ocean Institute, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, and the University of Minnesota, along with scientists from France and Germany. Descending into the pit crater, the summit of Luihi, is a lot like walking around Volcanoes National Park, except of course it's 3,000 feet below the sea surface. The team mapped Loihi's deepest reaches, more than 16,000 feet below, aboard Schmidt's research vessel Falkor, using the ship's multi-beam data and Woods Hole's autonomous underwater vehicle Sentry. Cutting edge technology, pioneer vehicle that targets and it just doesn't get tired, and maps at higher resolution and takes photographs that we couldn't otherwise gain. The expedition had three fundamental objectives. One, the geology of how the seamounts grow, how the Hawaiian Islands have grown through time. Two, the chemistry of the impacts of a leaky, iron-rich volcano spewing an iron plume out into the Pacific Ocean. And three, how the microbiology of the system interacts with the ocean around it. Marine microorganisms, or microbes, play a crucial role in sustaining life on Earth by producing oxygen, serving as the base of a food chain. At volcanically active areas like Lo'ihi, they provide a glimpse into the vast diversity of harsh conditions under which life has thrived, even raising questions about the possibility of life on other planets and moons. Microbes are actually taking advantage of the energy that's locked up in the rock and locked up in the hydrothermal fluids, rusting that iron, making a living out of it. UH scientists and researchers from the Hawaii Undersea Research Laboratory have been on the forefront of discovery at Lo'ihi for more than 25 years. That work paved the way for this latest wave of discovery, including mapping the base of the volcano, more than three miles below the surface of the ocean. There's acres and acres of this um, energetic microbial community that was previously unaccounted for. The wealth of new data is providing answers and leading to even more questions as UH continues to offer tremendous opportunities to undergraduate and graduate students and prove that it is home to one of the world's premier oceanography programs. The Department of Oceanography has a long history of working with students, working in the environment and answering some of the big questions, whether they be exploration-based or hypothesis-driven science-based. And On this particular expedition, we had a nice blend of being able to do both. You know, if we had a phone-in uh, program where it was live, I'm sure people have a lot of questions about, wow, what was that? Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of basic questions. How big was that vehicle? Mm -hmm. So AUV Sentry there is probably about two meters long or so, um, six feet and maybe about six or eight feet tall, uh, just a few feet wide. And so it's shaped almost... Um, like a big fish. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and so its, uh, its strength is being able to maneuver over very rugged terrain. And so there's other kinds of AUVs, autonomous underwater vehicles, that are meant to go out and map or sample from here to California. And they're shaped more like torpedoes, and they're concentrating mm. on very, very high power uh, to uh, extension of duration um, expeditions. Something like Sentry is very maneuverable, where it can come up to a wall like this and then stop with forward-looking sonar, realize that it's going to bump into something, and then fly straight up. Whereas mm. torpedo-shaped AUVs can't really do Would that. Would have run into it. Exactly. What was the mission when you sent it down there? To explore, to map, mm -hmm. and was some of this volcanic or, or origin a planned discovery or was it one of those? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great question and philosophically it's a little bit of both. Uh, federal funding agencies are very reluctant. They don't have the budgets to really fund pure exploration. We need hypothesis driven mm. science where okay. we've got a pretty good idea of what we're going to go and target and sample and find out. This recent expedition was supported by the Schmidt Ocean Institute, and so it's a philanthropic organization from Wendy and Eric Schmidt. Eric Schmidt was one of the founding CEOs of Google. Uh, oh, they've decided to get into the ocean science research business and hmm. offer ship time competitively to scientists. So Schmidt Ocean Institute was paying. That was a Google software. The, the guy was on the, uh, <laughs> on the computer. You know, it's Who all knows? probably tied okay. to Google stock price, but yeah. uh, it's not actually tied to Google. It's and okay. it's Eric and Wendy Schmidt. 
um, they provided the ship time, and uh, myself and other collaborators from across the country and uh, a couple from Germany and France as well uh, were able to get a little bit of research dollars to go along with this. Mm. And so we had a few targeted questions about the geology of the hotspot, about the chemistry of the volcano, about the microbiology of the system that we really wanted to answer through sampling and more conventional kind of research. Uh, we also had um, uh, about half the, the, the cruise was really dedicated to exploration around these deep sites at 5,000 meters that we found a few years ago but don't really don't know much about. Mm. From the Hawaiian Renaissance, the Hawaiian sovereignty and the new uh, discovery of Hawaii, we're going back prior to the actual formation of the islands. Mm -hmm. What have we learned about our islands that you guys discovered? Like you're sucking up mm -hmm. that the yellow mm -hmm. Biomass, or I forget. How sure. We're, we're yeah, it it's you know sometimes we make sacrifices mm -hmm. and go in the basement of a building and scrape some rusty pipes, and we can study some of the same kinds of water iron interactions. And sometimes they're microbially me mediated. Sometimes they're not. And other times we get to go out to sea and play with expensive robots and do this in a natural environment. Loihi provides us this great natural laboratory. That's the Hawaiian word you just used. Loihi. Loihi is mm -hmm. the. Uh, I think it actually science means science of. Long hand, and so um, yeah, I think it means hand. To be honest with you, I'm not. Mm. I, I don't remember. It, it's uh, dealing with the position of it relative to to the Big Island. Okay. Um, the neat thing from a, res a purely research perspective about Luihi is it's, it serves as this natural lab as a window into our past. And so today, mm. if you go out in the ocean, perhaps not a lot of places on the seafloor look exactly like Luihi does. It's not unique by any means. There's other places like it, but not a lot of places look like it. But in over the billions of years of Earth history, other times in Earth's history, much of the ocean may have looked like Luihi does today and the processes that are occurring at Luihi today mm. give us a window into Earth history. NASA also actually funds some of this kinds of work because they're interested in early Earth. They're also interested in what might be out there. And so they look at the kinds of robots that we're deploying, the kinds of research that we're using at 5,000 meters. And if they could get us to places like the icy moons of Europa and uh, into mm. oceans below the ice, we'd be doing the exact same kinds of science. Basic question of when it showed the puka and the heat and the mm -hmm. the water waves coming out of that. Is the image of a volcano that it comes out of one big one or just, or just a lot of small ones? Mm -hmm. uh, how many of those vents were actually seen down there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great question. And of course, the, the first peel of the onion later to, an to answer that is we don't know because we don't get there very often. Oh, okay. Now, we've identified probably about two dozen sites or so at Luihi over the last 20 years that are mm. very regularly venting like that. Some of them shut down, others become more vigorous. Uh, overall, since 96, the eruption, things have tended to get a little bit cooler in temperature. We're due for a new eruption maybe any time, any day now. Mm. Uh, and so that's really tied to the, the geology of the system and how the lava and how the magma chamber below the summit is really interacting with the rock around it. Uh, at the deep site, it's a little different. We don't see shimmering water like that or focused fluid venting. Instead, we have acres and acres. We've mapped over probably uh, 12 square kilometers in surface area, and in some places, as you saw in the video, you know, tens of centimeters or even a meter deep of that flocky orange stuff. And that's mm. bacteria. That's the extracts from bacteria and the uh, evidence for bacterial processes. Uh, now, we're very boring. We breathe air and we eat candy bars, and that's all we can do. Bacteria are very diverse, and these particular organisms that are driving the ecology of Luihi are taking iron out of the rock and out of the hydrothermal fluids, and they're rusting it. But that's how they gain an energy, and they're the base of the food chain there from mm -hmm. doing that process. Hmm. What are some of the applications that uh, may come out of this mm -hmm. research? Or what, what may be the end product of the research? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's so many. Uh, the, the geological perspective of understanding how the hotspot interacts with our seafloor and what it means for Hawaii and the Hawaii Emper Emperor Seamount chain uh, are, um, are important. And it, it, it raises issues of tectonics. It raises issues of earthquakes and prediction, uh, potentially uh, issues of predicting tsunamis or effects of tsunamis, these mm. kinds of geological um, real benefits to society as, in addition to understanding how Have you got seismic works. indicators there? I mean, the Hawaii's got the most advanced in the world in seismic de detection. At one time, there was a cabled observatory at the summit of Luihi. It had seismometers, it had any cameras and some other acoustic um, mm. phones. I don't think there's anything currently active out mm. there. 
Um, from a chemical perspective, it allows us to look at the ocean and say, how is the underwater volcano interacting with the Pacific Ocean around it, delivering all of this iron? What's the fate of that iron and the productivity of all those microbes mm -hmm. at the summit? From a fundamental biological perspective, we have, as I mentioned, a window into early Earth, Earth's history. Mm. Life may have originated on this planet in places that are hydrothermal, places like what we see at Louis today. What's the heat of that water that's coming out of the vents? Mm. It's about, Do you have a uh, measure? it is. It, it's less than 60 degrees centigrade today. Uh, at times, it has Give me been the street language for those who speak Fahrenheit. <laughs> yeah, of course, but it's less than 100 degrees, and less so it's less than boiling. But at, at depth like that, uh, it doesn't boil because of the pressure as well. Huh. Uh, today, it's closer to room temperature in many cases. All of the water around it is near freezing, just above freezing, and so... So how high up before it becomes just yeah, very normal well ocean? Mixed. Sure, very well mixed. That plume, as you saw, the shimmering water mm -hmm. coming out of the vent, we can still detect measurable, measurable concentrations of iron hundreds of meters above and hundreds, if not kilometers, uh, tens of kilometers away from the, from the orifice. And so you have this big leaky iron mountain coming out into the 1,000 meters depth in the Pacific. How far is the geothermal wells on the Big Island? How far do they go down? How deep? Oh, I'm not sure. I'm yeah. wondering if you've got, obviously, mm -hmm. we, we've got high electrical bills mm -hmm. in Hawaii and anything that is a natural resource like that is always helpful. Absolutely. There's never been any talk, or has there been any talk about any harnessing, if you will, mm -hmm all of those heat plumes that... Uh, Not that I know of at Luihi, and probably from a practical standpoint, uh, the answer is you don't need to because you have, you know, have the, the big island, and so you can tap mm -hmm. into it there in geothermal wells. Um, in Hawaii, we have the potential to be a poster child for the world for alternative energy sources. Speaking of the world, off camera, we talked about mm -hmm. the place of the oceanography department in world standing. Mm -hmm. uh, could you toot the horn a little bit on that? Because I'm going to certainly, after this interview, do it. Sure, sure. Um, you know, one of, one of the reasons I was so happy to stay at the end of my two-year postdoc uh, was because of some of the colleagues. And within the School of Ocean, Earth Sciences, and Technology, we are the oceanography uh, department among uh, geology department and uh, ocean engineering and also meteorology and a variety of different ocean institutes. Within the school, there's over 200 PhDs. There's a huge center for environmental sciences here in Hawaii that maybe isn't always uh, publicized. Mm -hmm. uh, within uh, SOAS, our, our oceanography department is certainly ranked in the, in the top 10 or so and competitive for bringing in the best graduate students and postdoctoral researchers. Let me say it a little more emphatically. We are the top 10 in the world in terms of oceanography. Top 10 in the world is quite a statement. And I know a lot of you may be thinking about this, the Wonder Blender and should UH cancel football. We don't pay attention to these good things that are going on like that because I think that is a real accomplishment that everybody should know about, including my colleagues in, in the legislature, because sometimes, particularly the Senate, has been very hard on the University of Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Some of these things need to be really uh, broadcast uh, loud and clear. That's true. Of the top 10, what is an ultimate, let me reverse it. So what? You're doing that. What's going to happen as an ultimate? You find the research, you write it up, and it's finished? Or is it going to be where we have really a lead on some of these things that are going to be a discovery or an application? Because if NASA's in it, NASA wants a payoff, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What are some of the practical application that you may see coming out of it? Sure. Or more it's PhD guys coming out of the University of Hawaii? Well, a little bit of both. And so there's the kind of the mm -hmm. fundamental pursuit of knowledge and what is the academic um, value of studying this kind of stuff. Uh, we graduate students, and so mm -hmm. students, some of them go for faculty positions. A lot of them don't. A lot of them go and become technicians or environmental scientists or mm -hmm. consultants mm -hmm. or something else. But the techniques that they, l that they learn and the inspiration they gain from going to places that other people don't get to see or learning scientific methods in places like this has value. And that's, that's something that isn't easy to put a dollar amount on. Uh, the spin-off technologies that come out of working with the engineers. You know, one of the favorite parts of my job is going to engineers and saying, here's my scientific research question. It's a basic mm. research question. It might not ever be commercialized, but this is why we want to understand it. How do we do it on your robot? And those are wonderful conversations, and they end up oftentimes in products that uh, you know, generate revenue for small businesses. What is Pele's pit of death? Yeah, so there's a couple of neat sites uh, <laughs> at Luihi. Um, Do you ever hear that? If you have, <laughs> you're in this top ten in the world uh, of, <laughs> of guys who know stuff that's going on at the bottom of the ocean. Which, by the way, don't we have the tallest mountain if we use the base floor of Absolutely. Mauna Kea? Because I've, I've actually been at uh, Sagramatha, Mount Everest, mm -hmm. where it's 29,009 feet. Mm -hmm. We actually have, at the bottom floor to the top of Mauna Kea, taller mountains than that, or at least a mass 
Absolutely. The the if you start from where you saw those big orange flocky mats at 5,000 meters below the sea surface and go all the way to the summit, uh, it's the largest, largest mountain. That's phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Anyways, Paley's Pit. Yeah, so you know, decades ago when these sites were kind of found, you know, some of them are, uh, are, are nods to the, the cultural significance of places like Louis Paley's Peak, uh, Paley's Pit. Uh, some of them are a little mm. bit more um, off the cuff, like the Pit of Death, which was mm. you know, several hundred meters deep, and one dive they went into there, and uh, some, uh, there was a large flux of gases and fluids that had killed a bunch of fish, and so it was a little bit more medieval. Another question here is, uh, even though these things were pretty small, you have it where there's a manned vehicle, mm -hmm. which I understand either for your PhD or after your PhD, you had to get into one of those? Yeah, I've got about uh, 12 or 13 dives in the submersible Alvin. Could you share with some of the viewers what it's like to be in one of those babies? It's very cool. Uh, it's tight, it's cramped, it's about six feet across, and you have three people crammed in there for eight or nine or 10 hours. Uh, depending on the depth of your site, you're looking at maybe two, two and a half hours of descent through the water column until you get to the bottom, turn on the lights, drop some extra weights, and start flying around and doing your work for maybe four or five or six hours, dr uh, drop the rest of the weights, and another two hours to the surface. Uh, it's thrilling. There's a need for human presence on the seafloor and exploration like that. That said, in the last 10 years... What do you mean there's a need for... You, you mean you get lonely or you no, 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 you it, no, need there, for presence in the There's value in having someone there with eyes to look. Oh. And so, you know, there's a little bit of this argument between do we spend $50 million to upgrade a new, sub, a new submarine that people can go and use and actually go to the bottom, or do we buy 10 ROVs? Have right? you talked to the Malaysians about that? Well, no. I mean, the Malaysian Airlines, yeah. they're still yeah. looking for a flight yeah. 370. You'll never find it with a human submarine, but with something like a torpedo that has very, very high resolution acoustic imagery of the bottom, that's how you do this, covering wide areas. And so you think about this continuum between, mm. um, you know, from mapping with a ship is kind of analogous to flying over the Big Island in a plane and using radar altimetry or something like that to get a map. And then mm. you find a spot that's very unique or very interesting. And so then you land with a helicopter and you walk around in the dark with a flashlight. And that's kind of like going with a submarine to the bottom. And you're looking around and you see what you see very well, but you don't get to see a lot of it. And so then what we do is we back up and we take you know, uh, uh, an octocopter in the daytime and we just mow the lawn back and forth and back and forth mm. and back and forth. And so you get a pretty good resolution spatial image over a much wider area. And that's kind of the analogy between shipboard mapping versus going there in a submarine versus a combination of ROVs and, and AEVs. How did you get interested in this? Um, yeah, when I was four years old, I told my parents I wanted to be a marine biologist. I couldn't <laughs> pronounce it. I, biology. You know, I, I didn't know what it was. I certainly didn't become one. I'm, I'm an oceanographer. Um, but, uh, you know, certainly in the early days, uh, images of Jacques Cousteau and just kind of having uh -huh. a feel for the ocean uh, led me down this path. I wouldn't change it. Before we wrap up, and it's not quite time, I want you to, uh, for any of the young kids who are out there and may have the four-year-old desire to be something about the ocean, what advice would you give or suggest to them? Yeah, it's great. And I have a three-year-old daughter, and you know, she's a scientist. She doesn't know it yet. And At three years old, that's not bad. Well, they ask questions, right? And they don't, ah. take, they, they don't take an answer for an answer. They want to see why or how. or you know, They want an explanation. And that's really the key is just keep asking questions. Uh, a little bit more pointed is get involved with your science teachers. At schools, get involved with UH. There's a, there's a much growing um, kind of a groundswell for community outreach and tying mm. researchers. We have volunteers in our labs from high schools, in some cases from middle schools, certainly from community colleges and outreach with the public. So uh, don't stop asking questions really. is, is the So they got to wait till they're in college before they do this? Not necessarily. There are uh, possibilities and there are uh, K through 12 programs where you know we've had, uh, I've answered phone calls from you know, eighth graders while I've been in the submarine before. And so uh, check out our websites. And, and you know, maybe What's the website? Um, <laughs> certainly at the University of Hawaii. Oh. Um, it, but if you, uh, you can Google me and you can find links to expeditions. You can Google uh, places like the Hawaii Ocean Time Series here in Hawaii. Mm. We have a you know, decades old time series that goes on a monthly basis, 100, 100 miles off the north of Oahu and samples the ocean. Mm. Uh, there's some big programs like that that really work with, with school kids and uh, individual PIs are typically willing to answer emails, even just... Uh, I have a elementary school kind of question I should have asked you in the beginning. What part of the earth is still water and the other is earth? 
Water, obviously, the vast majority is at 75, 80 percent? Yeah, that's great. Less? I like what to is? say, you know, Earth is a misnomer. We should never call ourselves Earth. We are planet ocean. <laughs> and at the surface, it's over 70 percent. <coughs> and the average depth of the ocean is, you know, more than two miles. Uh, this past summer, the U.S. lost its ability to visit the deepest parts of the ocean. With 11,000 uh, meters at the bottom, the vehicle imploded and was lost hmm. forever. It's down there. And that's a $9 million loss, and now the research community can't visit that. Where did it implode? This which, is in, which part in the Mariana's Trench. So oh, that's mm -hmm. in the Pacific, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, you know, the U.S. has the capability to visit 5,000, 6,000 meters, but not m the deepest parts of the ocean today. Uh, the Schmidt Ocean Institute is building a new 11,000 meter vehicle, but uh, uh, as researchers, we don't have that available in our National Deep Submergence facility. Mm. But I would hope there would be another vehicle taking its place. Yeah, it just takes money and time and talent. I mean, if we yeah. are not planet yeah. Earth, we are planet ocean yeah. or whatever, that, that's exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, in wrapping up, what would you say, and uh, this is back to the, those land investors, mm -hmm. given what you see as the pattern emerging, mm -hmm. what does it look, even though it's going to be many years down the line, what does it look like the future Island number six is going to be like for Hawaii. Uh, it'll I mean, look this is very speculative, I know, but sure. No, it, it'll look a lot like the Big Island does. It'll look like the Big Island. Sure, it, it's coming up. And if you look at the the newest points of Luihi, which are rising out of the water, at one time Kauai and beyond in the island chain looked like that. And so mm -hmm. we have this nice chrono sequence, a time series between the newest interactions of the hot spot with the seafloor and what they used to look like when looking at Kauai today. Professor, that is rather fascinating, and I would encourage you to keep doing those YouTubes. I know Professor sometimes is a little more introverted than mm -hmm. maybe not publicity-wise, and mm -hmm. this is not to publicize, but this is to educate and to bring people to up to speed that we are a University of Hawaii with international world standing, and Professor uh, Brian Glazer is the key uh, proponent of that, and I gather that as many, as you, as you said, there are 200 PhDs are they all on the same sheet of music? As you I know? wouldn't say I'm a key proponent. I'm one, but uh, oh. there's over 200 PhDs in SOEST, and uh, we're all pretty good, and uh, most of us are pretty approachable as well. And a few odd PhDs like myself go into politics and not into the great uh, increasing of science knowledge. Uh, Brian, we've run out of time, but I want to thank you on behalf of the people of Hawaii and the House of Representatives for doing this creation of new knowledge. That's what academics is all about, adding to the body of knowledge. So thank you very much. Oh, thanks I really for having me. It. it was a pleasure. And thank you for viewing. This is uh, Representative Gene Ward with a word for what, a very interesting word for word that we had from Pref Professor Glazer. Thank you for viewing. Thank you and aloha.